Why go to study Islam and why not become a doctor, for example? At the end of the day, if you don't know where you're going, you don't know how to get there. What is knowledge and why is it important? And to understand how important it is, we need to go back to the beginning. So the basis of Islam is one of knowledge and iqra. Islam has made seeking knowledge and ibadah. The biggest enemy of shaitan is ilm, is knowledge. And those who are worthy of praise are those who seek the knowledge. Our scholars, we should hold them in high regard. Why? That the superiority of a scholar over a worshipper, how do we seek knowledge? To seek the knowledge of Islam, you need one eye, not the eye of IQ, the eye of ikhlas. So when we look at knowledge, we see in terms of its genre, it's of two types. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam here is teaching us that even students are of two types. You're specializing in fiqh, then how should you go about that journey? Which books should you study? If you want to study hadith, what's the best way to study hadith? Which primer uh, to begin with? Should you memorize? If you memorize, how much should you memorize? How should that memorization process be? Knowledge needs patience. And that's what the scholars used to say, that the student of knowledge, he walks fast, he eats fast, and he writes fast. It's not about having book knowledge, my dear brother and elder in Islam. If you're seeking knowledge, seek it. When you are with a sheikh, what you learn from his character, his patience, his deliberation, deals with different matters. This knowledge you won't find in the books. You what Imam al-Shafi'i said, you will never achieve knowledge except through six. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa bihi nasta'een wa nusalli wa nusallim ala khatim al-Nabiyyin, Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathiran ila yawmiddin. Amma ba'd. اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا يا كريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي We begin in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name seeking his assistance and his blessings and we request praises and blessings upon Muhammad ibn Abdullah صلى الله عليه وسلم I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the outset to teach us that which benefits us and to bless us to benefit from that which he has taught us. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in knowledge and action. Ameen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this gathering a blessed gathering, a gathering that receives his mercy, a gathering that hears a good word and follows it, and a gathering that is inshallah forgiven upon its departure. Ameen. My dearest brothers in Islam, Salamullahi alaykum wa rahmatuhu wa barakatuh. May Allah's blessings, may His mercy, may His safety be upon you all. I just got into London, subhanallah. And um, it's an honor um, to begin the series of lectures, inshallah, that will be happening over the upcoming days. Uh, with this particular masjid, Masjid Humaira, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Uh, I was just reminded that I was last here about four years ago. SubhanAllah, how time flies. Um, because the masjid is close to my heart, it's beloved to me. And um, despite sometimes difficult schedules, it's always at the front of my mind, not the back of my mind, um, to visit uh, the community, to visit this masjid. So at or as such, from the outset, I must uh, seek uh, forgiveness and apologize for it being uh, four years. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open his heart uh, to forgive me and uh, bless his heart to open the doors of the masjid for me when I uh, next come, inshallah. Inshallah, it won't be uh, four years. My dearest brothers and elders in Islam, uh, the topic asked of me is the journey of knowledge. It is a topic, subhanallah, that isn't a new topic. It is a topic, alhamdulillah, discussed by the scholars of Islam since ever. Uh, we have many, a book written on this topic in the Arabic language, many a lecture in the Arabic language, and also, alhamdulillah, with the advancement of the world, the advancement of knowledge, we have this particular topic um, dealt with in many other languages as well, including the English knowledge. It's also a multifaceted topic. It can be covered from various different angles. And uh, when the topic first came to me, I thought this is more of a workshop, not just a lecture. And um, our Sheikh said, well, just try and cover it in a summarized way, in a way that inshallah is meaningful to an extent, 
uh, to the community, especially since it's been a while since this topic has been covered. Now, it, despite the topic having much um, on it, it is one of those topics that our scholars uh, take time out to review and to reteach um, their students in a timely manner. Why? Uh, because obviously the world moves at a very fast pace. And the topic of seeking Islamic knowledge is more than just an action, it's an act of worship. It's an act of worship. So just as the scholars would take time out to teach about salah and zakah and fasting, the other pillars of Islam and the related acts of worship around these pillars, they would take time out to discuss the journey of knowledge. Remind us to um, those fine points, those subtopics that make up the skeletal structure of uh, this particular topic. Now, from an Islamic perspective, um, knowledge is absolutely important. And to understand how important it is, we need to go back to the beginning. And that beginning is around 1,558 years, lunar years ago, when the world, and especially the Arabian Peninsula, was in a totally different state than we find the world in today. Um, that state was described as um, or it, 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 it was actually given a description. It carries a unique adjective. And the reason why it has this unique description, because the world back then, especially the Arabian Peninsula, it was governed by Asabiya and Hamiya. Asabiya, we can translate as tribal fanaticism and Hamiya as tribal pride. These two concepts were the basis for what constituted knowledge back then. The yardstick for differentiating between right and wrong, truth and falsehood, knowledge and ignorance were these two factors, Asabiya and Hamiya. And the Quran deals with these two matters clinically. And so does the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, so extensive was this paradigm, this paradigm of Asabiya and Hamiya, tribal fanaticism and pride being the base for knowledge, so extent it was that it even captured the adjudication processes known back then, or the judicial processes known back then. In cases of dispute, adjudicators would, um, they would support the tribal interest unreservedly. Common sense didn't have a role to play. And this was amongst those considered respectable. When we talk about an adjudicator or someone acting in the capacity of a judge, right? you attribute to them a level of intellectual ability that you wouldn't attribute to the general public. But even they would use as their yardstick for ruling the idea of Asabi and Hamiya. Unreservedly, they would support their tribe, their clan, their people, irrespective of who was right and who was wrong. From our perspective, we would call this irrational, all right? We would call, we would call this kind of behavior, a beha we would describe it as a behavior void of, of praise, void of any virtue. But from their perspective, subhanAllah, this idea of being irrational was praiseworthy. In fact, those who wrote on the Jahili period, this period of ignorance, and this was the title of this period, the period of ignorance, um, they understood the normative realities of that time from Jahili poetry. Because poetry was seen as the greatest intellectual property of that time. And that poetry captured the sentiments of that time, the reality of that time. And even those from the Orientalists who've written on the Jahili period, they square their discussions solely from Jahili uh, poetry. And when we look into Jahili poetry, we see um, verse after verse describing the state and um, a reality of that time. Am Amr ibn Khultum, for example, who was a renowned Jahili poet, expressively states, Ala la yajhalna ahadun alayna. 
سبحان الله <تصفيق> he goes on to say فنجهل فوق جاهل الجاهلين in these lines of poetry he confirms this irrationality and this irrational behavior for in it he's saying that um, his group is willing to be even more irrational with those who act in an irrational way towards them. He says, no one should behave in an, in an irrational way with us, for we are willing to behave even more uh, in a more um, uh, extreme, uh, irrational manner than those who um, manifest irrationality towards us. Zuhair ibn Nabi Salma, for example, another celebrated Jahili poet, he further captures the events of Jahiliya when he poetically says, وَمَنْ لَا يَظْلِمْ عَلَى النَّاسِ يُظْلَمْ or عَلَى النَّاسِ يُظْلَمْ He says that the person who doesn't oppress others, they will be oppressed. That was the system of the time. You wake up preparing to oppress others, otherwise you will eventually be oppressed. And we spoke about the Orientalist, Reynold Nicholson, who was an English uh, Orientalist, when discussing uh, Jahiliya from Jahili poetry, he describes it by saying that there was no written code. There was no legal or religious sanction, except the binding force of traditional sentiment and opinion. And he means by this honor. Which type of honor? Tribal honor. Asabiyya and Hamiya. And he further states that the elite, the chiefs, they would lay commands or penalties on, or they would never lay commands or penalties on their fellow tribesmen. And they were free to rebuke presumption. This was the nature of the time. Now, here we see that the yardstick for knowledge or judgments was basically ignorance. But then came another event, an event decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if that period was described as the period of ignorance, then this event is known as the event of iqra' wal qalam. The event of read and the event of the pen. And this event is known to us from the very first verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the cave of Hira. The five verses of Surah Al-Alaq, the first five verses of the Quran. For in these verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly reveals a command towards reading, meaning seeking knowledge. And also he manifests for us the instrument and tool of Islam, that instrument and tool being the pen. اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ We see the verb being repeated again This command towards reading وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to himself as the one who taught using the pen And in another surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the pen In surah al-qalam نون والقلم وما يسطرون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the pen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not take an oath except by that which is praiseworthy. Allah takes an oath by the pen and that which the pen inscribes. So the basis of Islam is one of knowledge and iqra. And the tool of Islam is one of knowledge and the pen. And since that time, knowledge became the most celebrated intellectual property of humanity. But as we know, my dear brother and, brother and elder in Islam, knowledge carries different forms. I mean, if you spoke to the people of Jahiliya during Jahiliya, they wouldn't have called themselves ignorant. They would have called themselves people of knowledge. Knowledge comes in many, many shapes, many forms, many ways. And what Iqra brought through the world was a manifestation of what ultimate knowledge is. And ultimate knowledge was revealed knowledge. قال الله وقال الرسول What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed and what is Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught and as scholars furthered the discussions they said قال الصحابة and that which the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم أجمعين said because they were the first students of Islam. The direct students of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so they were most qualified to teach us the meanings of قال الله and قال الرسول to teach us the meanings of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed 
either in the Quran or via his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And further evidence for this of knowledge being revealed knowledge is found in Surah Al-Ma'idah in verse number 50. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealing with the ignorant says, أَفَحُكْمَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ يَبْغُونَ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حُكْمًا لِقَوْمٍ يُقِينُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says then is it the judgment of the time of ignorance that they desire? But who is better than Allah in judgment for a people who are certain in terms of their faith regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So here in this verse, my dear brother and elder in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala differentiates between that which they called knowledge during jahiliyyah and what is revealed knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting that those who seek the knowledge of jahiliyyah, then indeed they are void of praise. And those who are worthy of praise are those who seek the knowledge revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this idea that we've called revealed knowledge. In fact, in this very same masjid, once I recall teaching you all, when we did the tafsir of Surah Rahman, that mankind is only considered a mercy from Allah's mercies if they act upon revealed knowledge. And we learned this from the very beginning of Surah Al-Rahman. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Rahman, He opens the surah with His name denoting extensive mercy, the one who possesses mercy that is so vast nothing can escape it. And then throughout the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to us a mercy from His mercies. And immediately He reveals Allama al-Qur'an. Ar-Rahman, Allama al-Qur'an. Ar-Rahman, the entirely merciful one. Allama al-Qur'an, the one who taught the Qur'an. خلق الإنسان and the one who created insan. Now if we ponder over these verses, we deduce and, and, and realize that the creation of mankind happened before the revelation of the Qur'an. The creation of mankind happened before the Qur'an was taught. Adam alayhi salam was created long before the advent of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the revelation of the Qur'an. But despite this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights as a mercy from his mercies the revelation of the Qur'an before the creation of mankind. For those who ponder over this, the deduction is that mankind is a mercy, yes, but when mankind acts upon revealed knowledge, upon the knowledge of the Qur'an which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught. Subhanallah. So such is the nature, my dear brother and elder in Islam, of the status of knowledge in Islam. And our journey through ignorance into knowledge is the right of knowledge itself. And it is an obligation upon every human being. And this has to be our understanding. That whenever we see the opportunity to learn, we recognize that that opportunity is the right of knowledge itself. And it is also an obligation upon every human being. And this obligation, my dear brother and elder in Islam, manifests itself as the scholars of fiqh teach us in two forms. The first form being an individual obligation. Knowledge that every human being needs to know. And if you're a Muslim, then every Muslim needs to know this knowledge. It's not enough for Islamic scholarship to hold this knowledge. So when we look at knowledge, we see in terms of its genre, it's of two types. Knowledge that every Muslim needs to know. And this is, or the ruling of this knowledge is that it's compulsory al ain It's compulsory upon every individual. The obligation applies to every individual. Seeking that knowledge needs to happen by every individual. Not just for those who are considered students of knowledge. And no doubt, this knowledge applies to the core matters of our faith. If you, pray, if you have to pray... It is an obligation upon you to learn the rules of salah. And from them the rules of purification and wudu and ghusl. If you save enough money and zakah applies to you, it's compulsory upon you to learn the rules of zakah. What does zakah apply to? Who are the recipients of zakah? When is zakah discharged? How is that zakah discharged? And so on and so forth. It's not knowledge that should only be with the scholars. If that act of worship applies to you, it's compulsory upon you now to visit those scholars and seek that knowledge. If you start trading, there's Islamic laws that Allah has revealed which apply to trade. 
it now becomes an individual obligation, an obligation upon you to seek out that knowledge. It's not enough for that knowledge to be with Islamic scholarship. When you get married, for example, Islam has revealed laws about this. You have to seek out that knowledge. You can't go into the space of marriage with ignorance. How to marry, the rights of the spouses, how to divorce. Not that you go into marriage with divorce, but the knowledge of it needs to be learned as well. The rights of the children, the rights of the children over the parents and vice versa. The rights of the bonds of kinship and the, ex and the extended family and the in-laws and so on and so forth. We need to learn what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed directly in the Quran or via his Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the sunnah. It's not enough for this knowledge to be with Islamic scholarship. It becomes an individual obligation. So this is um, the first form of knowledge, that which applies to everybody. The second is knowledge that is obligatory, but obligatory as an community obligation. Al-Fard al-Kifai. It's a communal obligation. It's knowledge that everyone doesn't need to know, but there have to be individuals from that community who go out and seek it, so there can be a reference for those within the community when those within the community require that knowledge. And this idea of communal obligation should help us learn the importance of the students of knowledge and the importance of the scholars of Islam. Because them going out to seek this knowledge relieves us of the obligation. A communal obligation entails an obligation upon everybody until someone from that community goes out and takes care of that act. Once they go out and take care of that act, the obligation is lifted off the, off the rest of the people. So those who go out to seek knowledge, we should hold them in high regard. Our scholars, we should hold them in high regard. Why? Because they went to seek that knowledge or take care of this act of worship and because they did so, the obligation upon us all was lifted. Does that make sense? So they go out and learn the laws of Islam, the rules of Islam, the theological rules, the jurisprudence rules, and so on and so forth, with as much completion as possible. And as such, they become a reference point for us when we require that knowledge. So as we can see here, there's knowledge in terms of our lives that can be from the genre of, of a communal obligation until a point, and then it becomes an individual obligation. Does that make sense? Right? So for example, before we have to pray, that knowledge is a communal obligation. If some people go out to study it, alhamdulillah, the obligation is lifted off us. But when we need to pray, does it remain a communal obligation or does it become an individual obligation? What happens? In terms of the ruling, it becomes an individual obligation. When you get married, that knowledge that you didn't need to know, it was enough for your scholars to know it. What happens? to the ruling in terms of yourself. Does it remain a communal obligation or does it become an individual obligation? It becomes an individual obligation. So as you can see, knowledge from an Islamic perspective is so deeply rooted that we even have these uh, rules from, from a fiqhi jurisprudence perspective attached to it. And as such, my dear brother and elder in Islam, Islam has made seeking knowledge an ibadah for the believer an act of worship for the believer. And even for the disbeliever, if they seek this knowledge and as a result become a Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them twice. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith of Abu Musa, ثَلَاثَةٌ يُؤْتَوْنَ أَجْرَهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنَ There's three people that will receive their rewards twice, doubled. Then he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَمُؤْمِنُ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ الَّذِي كَانَ مُؤْمِنًا ثُمَّ آمَنَ بِالنَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَلَهُ أَجْرًا That those from the people of the book who believed in their prophets and then they lived after the advent of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and believed in him. For them, they will be rewarded jewelfold as well. They will get a double reward. So here we see subhanAllah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even rewards the disbeliever for their seeking of knowledge after they act on it. That they won't just get the reward for the Islam, but the reward for their effort before Islam. 
for the knowledge that they followed, that they knew from the previous Prophet before that led them to believe after the advent of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about the teacher of knowledge in the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu an. He said that he who is asked about knowledge of Islam and conceals it, he will be bridled with a bridle of fire on the day of judgment. Subhanallah. And here we learn, O servant of Allah, the status of knowledge. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it forbidden for anyone to hide that knowledge. To conceal that knowledge. That when you know and you know that you know. And then someone is in need of that knowledge. It is forbidden for you to keep that knowledge a secret. It is forbidden for you to conceal that knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared a severe punishment for the one who conceals this knowledge. Which knowledge? The knowledge of qala Allah, wa qala rasul wa qala sahaba The knowledge of Allah says, and his Rasul said, and the Sahaba said. And in terms of the reward of sharing this knowledge, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiyallahu an, he says, Sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, Naddar Allah umra'an, sami'a minna shay'an, fabalaghahu, fabalaghahu kama sami'a, farubba muballaghin aw'a lahu min sami'in. Rawahu Tirmidhi. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Imam Tirmidhi records this in his jami'ah. He says, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brighten the face of a man who hears something from us and conveys it to others as he has heard it. For many, a person to whom knowledge has reached conveys it to another who hears it from him who understands it better than the one who carried that knowledge. All right? The point of this narration is the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the one who conveys knowledge. You can see that Islam has a complete system here when it comes to knowledge. That you seek it, that you don't conceal it, that you reveal it. There's a punishment for those who conceal and the rewards for those who share is great. And also we learn from this narration, and this is a, a footnote to the discussion. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam here is teaching us that even students are of two types. There's some students who memorize well. And there's some students, subhanallah, who understand well. Well, here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that many a carrier of fiqh or a carrier of knowledge carries it to somebody who understands it better than the carrier. Subhanallah. And Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi, he has this observation of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum. And Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum, he's a major uh, companion. But he was from the young companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which means that even though he has many a narration, very few you can count them on, on the fingers of one hand. He narrates directly from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Majority of his narrations, rawahu bil wasata, as the scholars say, he uh, he narrated these narrations with an intermediary. However, subhanallah, if you look at the fiqh of Abdullah ibn Abbas. It surpasses many of the senior Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'i. And we know that Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, he narrated the most narrations from the era of the Sahaba. And Imam al-Zuhri from the era of the Tabi'een. Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, who revealed most of the narrations from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time of the Sahaba, he doesn't have the level of fiqhi deductions that we find with Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu an. And this is a footnote anyway. Uh, just to complement the latter part of the hadith. That if we ponder over it, we see that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not only praising the one who conveys, but is also teaching us that those who convey, they convey to those who learn. And those who learn are of two types as well. We have the memorizers and we have those who, who understand. About the knowledge uh, that is received and the one who acts on this knowledge, Islam has... Um, virtuous rewards for that person. For the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about the scholar of Islam, وَفَضْلُ الْعَالِمِ عَلَى الْعَابِدِ كَفَضْلِي عَلَى أَدْنَاكُمْ Subhanallah. That the superiority of a scholar over a worshipper is like my superiority over the least of you. The superiority of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over the least of the ummah. And this is the status that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is holding the scholar of Islam. So here we see narration after narration about knowledge, the carrier of knowledge, the sharer of knowledge, the student of knowledge. In fact, about the one who seeks knowledge, 
The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiyallahu an, man ta'allama ilman, and this is to teach us the noble nature of knowledge, and that it's an act of worship. It cannot be done for any worldly gain. It cannot be done to eat from. He says, man ta'allama ilman mimma yubtagha bihi wajhu Allah azza wa jal. He says, whoever seeks knowledge, knowledge through which Allah's pleasure is sought through seeking it, but rather they do it. Why? So that they can gain material well-being. They can gain a financial standing. They can build for themselves some goodwill within the community. And maybe people will say, you know what? We should get our daughters married to him because he attends the lectures. MashaAllah. We see him at the masjid. And sometimes shaitan enters our, uh, our lives through different corridors. Right? Ibn al Jawzi in Talbis Iblis, subhanAllah, he has an important observation when he talks about the deception of Iblis. He says sometimes Iblis deceives a person by leaving them in an ibadah, by leaving them in a noble act, by leaving them in an act of worship. But how does he deceive them and take them towards misguidance and, and towards going astray? By pushing them hard into it so that they become extreme. And they become oblivious. That they fall into it to an extent that they become detached from the intention that led them there. And rather what they do becomes a norm. And then it becomes populated through other ideas as well, through the whispers of shaitan. And this happens. Sometimes you find a person, he is, wants to do the adhan or he wants to attend a lecture because he knows there's a girl I'm interested in and her father is going to be at the lecture. He might be smiling now. But this is something we know firsthand, right? These are things that happen. And sometimes we meet people who want to seek knowledge. Why? And I've heard this myself. Because we want to travel. Whoever seeks knowledge with these misappropriated intentions, then as you saw, in terms of the one who conceals knowledge, Allah has decreed a severe punishment. Allah has decreed a severe punishment on the one who seeks knowledge for other than Allah's pleasure. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever does this, they will never ever smell the fragrance of Jannah on the day of Qiyamah. Subhanallah. So see my dear brother and elder in Islam, how much we have and the narrations are countless. In fact, Imam al-Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi in his Riyadh al-Salihin, when he comes to the chapter of knowledge, it's one of his larger chapters in, in the whole book, subhanallah. And when you go through the narrations that he's left, you actually feel that the Imam had to hold himself from continuing. Because after that he goes into uh, the virtues of the adhkar. Uh, and some of the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You actually feel that he had to hold himself. Because as you read the book uh, regularly you notice a pattern. As you go through his different chapters and his different abwab. When he comes to the virtues of knowledge. Yasruduhu sarda as the scholars say. He releases hadith after hadith. Hadith after hadith. Hadith after hadith. Forgetting. It feels as if he forgot the actual um, uh, paradigm that he had for himself in terms of how he wrote this book and the target audience that he had. Now, I hope through this, my dear brother and elder in Islam, we learn from this the answer to what and why. What is knowledge? Qala Allah wa qala Rasul wa qala Sahab. And why is it important then for the different angles that I've shared with you? The fiqhi angle, the angle of the teacher, the angle of the seeker, the angle of the concealer, the angle of the sharer, the angle of the one who seeks his knowledge with the wrong intentions. I hope through all of this you can see, subhanAllah, how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in 23 years, even though he was busy with tawheed and trying to break people away from the shackles of shirk and so on and so forth, he had the time to teach the sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een all these matters pertaining to knowledge. In fact, if you go deeper, there's chapters in the books of scholars dedicated to um, the etiquettes of seeking knowledge. Adab, talab al-ilm the morals, the manners, the etiquettes. But inshallah for our purpose, this suffices. And uh, to bring some completion, and then inshallah we can um, move the discussion into uh, uh, looking at something else. And that is, how do we seek knowledge? We know what knowledge is. We know why it's important. But how do we go about seeking knowledge? Now, as I said, this it's multifaceted. Different books of our scholars, Imam Al-Ghazali has writings on this, Imam Ibn Jama'ah uh, has writings on this. Um, in terms of our latest scholars, Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid is from the most famous who's written 
and spend time uh, doing tarbiyah of the students of knowledge and sharing with them the, 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 the tarbiyah and the etiquettes and the morals and the manners uh, pertaining uh, to knowledge. There's multiple angles. Uh, some of the angles that our scholars um, use when dealing with this topic is, is science-based. So for example, if, you, if, you, if you're specializing in fiqh, then how should you go about that journey? Which books should you study? Uh, should you stick to a madhab? Should you not stick to a madhab? If you stick to a madhab, for example, what's the process there? For example, the Hanbali madhab, if you're studying fiqh, then you start with a primer, for example, like al-umda. Then after that, you go into uh, a book that comes after it, al-muqni' for example, um, which is slightly more advanced in terms of the amount of masail, the amount of rulings uh, that are mentioned in it, but it sort of carries the same um, style and approach of, of uh, al-umda, which is keeping things simple without going too much into evidence and details. Then after that, al-kafi, for example, which uh, takes you into the difference of opinion within the Hanbali madhab and going into the evidences for the rulings and then no doubt al-mughni, for example, uh, of Ibn Qudama. All these books are of Ibn Qudama, by the way, rahmatullahi alayhi, al-mughni, which is for, uh, for a person who reaches the level of ijtihad whereby you can study fiqh in a comparative level. So this is one angle that the scholars use. If you want to study hadith, what's the best way to study hadith? Which primer uh, to begin with? Should you memorize? If you memorize, how much should you memorize? How should that memorization process be? Should you go into jarh wa ta'adil? Jarh wa ta'adil is a science from the science of hadith early, or should you delay it? Which is jarh wa ta'adil is uh, the manner of grading narrators within the chain of uh, the, uh, of the narrations. When should you study al-jarh? At the beginning or should you do it at the end? And so on and so forth. The same applies with tafsir. So some scholars deal with the journey of knowledge from a science-based uh, uh, approach. Um, I thought about this and I thought, inshallah, given the timeline that, that we have, I'll share with you some ideas from my own experience with uh, some of uh, the students and those who ask questions about seeking knowledge, so inshallah, um, help you, inshallah, in your considerations. And uh, perhaps it can be a means of sharing something that hasn't been shared before. Um, when we talk about the how, how should I seek knowledge? Let's keep it general without focusing on any specific science. Um, over time, I've noticed that many a student of knowledge does a disservice to themselves. Why? Because they go into the process without understanding what they want to achieve from it. And that is why over time my own advice uh, to others changed. And one of the first things I do now is ask the question why. And not even when a person is going to study, even if a parent comes to me for example and says, Sheikh, can you write a reference letter for my son uh, to go to study abroad? The first question I ask the parent is why? Not why should I write the letter for your son? But why do you want your son to go abroad? Well, let me speak to your son and understand from him why does he want to go to Medina or Riyadh or uh, any other place to study? Why? Is, that, is there some thought in the mind of this person regarding the outcome? What do you want to achieve? Why? Why go to study Islam and why not become a doctor, for example? Why not become an engineer, for example? I want to understand this. Right? Because through this, I'm able to formulate uh, better advice for this person. And sometimes it's a case that this person is not cut out to go and um, uh, seek Islamic knowledge. And that's fine because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with different capacities. As we also learned just now from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that some memorize better even within the, 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 the realm of seeking knowledge, some memorize better, some understand better. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with different abilities, different innate abilities. And we see how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nurtured the sahaba. Right? He, he used Khalid ibn Walid in a way that was best suited to Khalid. Abdurrahman ibn Awf in a manner that was best suited to Abdurrahman Abdur ibn Awf. The dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for Abdurrahman ibn Awf who was a natural trader was different to his dua for Khalid ibn Walid who was a specialist in warfare. His application with Abu Hurairah radiallahu an was different to his application with Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. We see this from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He wasn't pushing everyone to become a reference uh, in terms of Islamic knowledge, but rather he was guiding them to uh, excel in terms of their natural ability, but also to learn that which they needed to know in terms of their own lives. This is what the Prophet ﷺ did. 
If you look at uh, the fuqaha from the Sahaba, if you count on, if you count the fatawa from the era of the Sahaba, and even if you add to your account those who are only known to have passed one fatwa, you probably wouldn't pass 110 companions. At most 120. And I'm adding to the count those who are known to have passed only one fatwa. Okay? And if you talk about the muftis from the Sahaba, then they are only seven. And even at the time of the Sahaba, seven were references for the rest of the companions. Meaning these who were known to have passed the most fatwa. Subhanallah. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is not from them. Believe it or not. Right? Um, so this should give you an understanding of how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nurtured them. He nurtured those to become references in terms of Islam and he nurtured others to excel and realize the other potentials that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them to achieve and created them to be. And this should be our dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Ya Allah, assist me in achieving that which you created me to achieve. And أَعِنِّي عَلَىٰ أَنْ أُحَقِّقَ مَا خَلَقْتَنِي لِأَجْلِي Assist me in achieving that which you created me to achieve. You created me to achieve something, to do something, aid me in achieving that. This should be our dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's say a person is from the ilk. They're from the genre of people that should seek knowledge. Then the starting point should be what do you want to achieve from this knowledge? Do you want to learn just what every Muslim needs to know? Or do you want to learn that plus understand the Quran? Or do you want that and you want to understand the Quran and you want to recite it in a, in a particular way? This is important. Once I met a parent whose child memorized the Quran, but he was sad. Why? Because the child couldn't read in a particular way. Now my response to the father was, but when did you realize that you wanted your child to read in this particular way? Because if you realize at the beginning, you would have found the right teacher for your child. There's a difference between a teacher who can teach your child hif and a teacher who can teach your child hif and the qira'ah. And the, the ambition that this father had really needed him to have moved to Egypt for the four years or the three years. Right? So what do you want to achieve? Do you want to achieve the status of scholarship? The status of expertise in terms of the Islamic sciences so that you may eventually become a reference, for example. This needs to be clear. What do you want to achieve? You see, my dear brother and elder in Islam, this is fundamentally important because at the end of the day, if you don't know where you're going, you don't know how to get there. And when you seek knowledge generally, and especially Islamic knowledge, there's two elements that have to be captured. Number one, the curriculum. And number two, the teacher. You cannot be an effective student of knowledge if you don't have the right curriculum and you don't have the teacher. And even the Quran, and it is the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it with a messenger who would be a teacher of the Quran. And Allah revealed, you could say, the curriculum and he sent the teacher to distribute it. So if you don't know what you want to get from your journey, you will make a mistake with the curriculum and you will make a mistake as well with the teacher. And this is uh, perhaps if we ponder over our own journey for those who have tried to learn certain things, uh, you might nod your head and say, subhanallah, that's a point, right? For example, you want to learn um, the Quran. Where should you start? A good teacher will guide you. A good teacher will sit you down will understand your ability, your level, your current level, what you want to achieve, and accordingly they will set out for you the curriculum. Should you start with Gharaib al-Qur'an, for example, Ibtida'an, meaning read the, read the Qur'an and use a book that deals with words that are considered uh, difficult to understand in the Qur'an. There's books dedicated to this. They capture all those words, you read, you get stuck, you go to that book, you capture that meaning, and you go through the process twice, thrice, ten times until alhamdulillah you can read the Quran and there's no word that's strange to you. Should that be the starting point? Then after that you move it forward and go into 
uh, learning Arabic and the uh, and even when you learn Arabic, how should you start? Should you start with the colloquial Arabic? Should you go through um, uh, uh, a more theoretical approach? And we see different books on this. For example, the Medina curriculum is different to Arabiya Baini Adik, which is another famous uh, curriculum for studying Arabic, right? Uh, if my preference when I teach my students is for them to begin from the practical realm, the speaking realm, then personally I would advise them towards Arabiya Baini Adik before the Medina syllabus. I know the Medina syllabus is a very famous one, right? But this approach, if I as a teacher see this as most appropriate for the student to develop the ability with the language, as a teacher, I will decide the curriculum, right? As a teacher, I will have former knowledge about the ability of the curriculum, the gaps in the curriculum. Every curriculum has a gap. There's no perfect curriculum out there. Like Arabiya Baini Adik, for example, between book two and three, there was a big gap. Now they've, yani, alajahu, they've, they've come up with a, with a new edition and they've come up with an intermediary book between two and three to fill that gap. And they took feedback from people. Right? But it's only a teacher who can help you pick up these gaps. If you think you're just going to pick up the book and study by yourself, you don't know what you want to achieve, so you don't know the effectiveness of the curriculum in terms of what you want to achieve and you self-studying, then this is not appropriate. Okay? So, the point is, have a vision. What do you want to achieve? Accordingly, after that, you build your process. And that is why, especially in, in later times, we see that one of the greatest um, criticisms of the Islamic seminaries is this here. Because Islamic seminaries are fixed. You go to Adarul Ulum, or you go to Medina, or you go to Riyadh, the curriculum's fixed. It's set in stone, right? The key performance indicators are set upon the teachers. They will be judged by what they teach you in that semester. Everything is set. There's no little room to maneuver. And because the curriculum is bigger than the time span, there's no room for the teacher to come with any additions. If anything, there's subtractions, which doesn't help anyone's course. But Islamic seminaries are criticized for not doing enough in funneling the right students into those curriculums. That you know what this curriculum is, there has to be a process in ensuring that the student that's coming through into that curriculum is the right student for that curriculum. It, 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 this process isn't there. And this is something that our mashayikh criticize about the jamiat and the Islamic seminaries. That it puts everybody in there and then pushes you through and there's people who graduate, but you see the levels of understanding and acquisition are at odds. Because the curriculum wasn't set for everybody, but rather it was suitable for a portion of those who went in there. When I um, uh, entered Kuliyot al-Sharia in Riyadh, we were over 1,000 students in, in, in the first year. I had 10 classes, each class over 100 students. My class had about 118 students. All right? And you can, that curriculum, for example, was set for those who graduated from the Ma'ad al-Ilmi. The Ma'ad al-Ilmi is, is a secondary school which is dedicated towards studying Islam. You have schools that teach you geography, math, science. This school is all Quran, Tafsir, Hadith, Fiqh, and you, you go through it. So the curriculum in Kulit al-Shari'a was Rawd al murbi' which is a Hanbali uh, later text. But why was it Rawd al murbi' Because at, in the Ma'ad al-Ilmi, they study Zad al-Mustaqni'a which is one of the primers of the, Han of the Hanbali Madhab. So this curriculum is set for those who come from there. What about those who didn't come from there? Like myself, for example. <laughs> and others as well, who came from um, the normal conventional secondary schools. So here you see the issue, everybody has to put in different levels of work. And not many people are cut out for it. And that's why people drop out. People drop out. When we started, we were over a thousand. You find an exam, had around 570 people. Those who graduated, when I graduated, were about 340 from over a thousand. Subhanallah. And our teachers would tell us, if you survived the first four semesters of Kulit al-Shari'a, honey alak, congratulations. <laughs> they already set the tone for us, that before two years you will drop out from here. Because that's how intense it is. But here you see that this is not the most ideal way of seeking knowledge. In fact, if you look at the scholars of the past, they would study a book with a teacher for years. They would study a book firstly at a macro, uh, at a macro level. That's how they would study it. No bells and whistles. Read the text, understand the text. Then they would restudy it again with the teacher with the evidences now. 
That's it. Understand the ruling and the evidence for that ruling. Then they would restudy it again for the third time with the khilaf, which is minor within the madhab. Within the same madhab. So now you have two evidences and they're teaching you how to treat those evidences. At this, because now you established, you've understood it at a macro level. You've understood the baseline ruling. Now you're going into difference of opinion. Then they take you further and further until you go cross spectrum, across the madhaib. Today I know students who study in an Islamic seminary and they go for hajj for example or Ramadan comes and it's zakat time and they're calling you asking you for a fatwa. They say, Shaykh, what's the ruling on this? I say, but brother, you should know this. I know you studied in this program. Because, yeah, Shaykh, Wallahi, I know that there's four views. Just tell me, what should I do? And this is a problem. Right? Because what happens is when you are seeking knowledge in the wrong system, basically you are in a process of gathering thaqafa amma, as they say. General knowledge. You're not establishing yourself as a student of knowledge. At-ta'asil, the fuqaha talk about at-ta'asil al-ilmi. Establishing yourself with the knowledge that you have this is beyond you. This is uh, studying fiqh, for example, like you just read something on Google generally. You're just trying to develop general knowledge. Someone says, you know, what's the ruling if you leave Muzdalifa before midnight? You say, oh, there's three. I know there's three views on the matter. Uh, but what should I do? I don't know. Right? Now, if that is your vision for seeking knowledge, there's no problem. But if the student doesn't want to have thaqafa amma, they want to be established, they don't want general knowledge, then this is a problem as well. Do you get it? So understanding what you want to achieve is the first step. And from there, you go on the journey of picking the teacher and the teacher will decide for you the curriculum because the teacher will see, do you memorize well? For example, another issue, we've just said this. Some memorize well, some don't. In university, for example, the teacher would say, right, 20 marks for those who memorize this book this semester. And those who don't memorize, that's 20 marks gone. And not everyone can memorize. All right? And some people, they can memorize, but they need hours and hours. And mashallah, some people, they just need minutes. So it's, it's, you have, ideally, you want to find out what you want to achieve and then find the teacher and then let the teacher help you with the curriculum. And this is what I try and do uh, with the students. I've, I've, there's no blanket, uh, uh, there's no one brush paints all. Especially for those who have jobs, some are married, some aren't married, some are studying a degree, some are working t double shifts, some are working single shifts, some can tr study online, some can't study online, and so on and so forth. In this day and age, you got to build something that's sustainable for people so that the process doesn't just become pastime, but it develops into something else. Okay, so what's the first requirement? Have a vision. And accordingly, pick your teacher and ask your teacher to draft for you a curriculum. Are there any other requirements? Yes. Developing for yourself willingness and having a desire. This is what the, what the scholars of Islam call raghba, raghba dakhiliya. You have to have a desire and a passion to maintain that desire. Why? Because this is an ibadah. And the moment you do it, shaitan is going to stand in front of you. You have to understand the biggest enemy of shaitan is ilm, is knowledge. The period of ignorance was celebratory for shaitan because it was filled with no knowledge. Ilm is the antidote to ignorance. Shaitan loves ignorance and shaitan hates knowledge. Knowledge empowers a human being, subhanallah, with his Lord like nothing else. So you have to have this raghba and you have to be willing to maintain that raghba. Every day as you continue, shaitan will chip away at you. The willingness to maintain that raghba entails you connecting yourself back to your original intention. And looking at what we said first, what is knowledge and why is it important? Going back to the virtues of knowledge, reminding yourself why is this important? The value that you're creating, why does it matter to you? It should be, right? What's more, it's beloved to us to be able to have a relationship with Allah in a manner that's built on as fewest mistakes as possible. Not so. That's what we love. Right? When you have a doctor, for example, in the family, isn't it uh, a breath of fresh air? Anything happens, your father's a doctor. Immediately he can remove from you the anxiety. Tell you, no, no, don't worry, this is a small matter. Your brother's a doctor, doesn't it help? It helps. Imagine you, 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 you have knowledge about your deen. You have knowledge about your salah. What happens to your fear of making a mistake in your worship of Allah? You have knowledge about your zakah. 
What happens about your, this anxiety that we feel? Ramadan comes, my zakah, is it counted? Is it it counted? That this charity did this and the common questions that come. If you have knowledge prior, does that increase anxiety or decrease anxiety? It decreases it. So you remind yourself of the virtues of seeking knowledge and this assists you. And if I can take it further in a practical way, when you maintain your desire for seeking knowledge, your paradigm for what constitutes maintenance time and actual time changes. I'm sure you've read these concepts in time management. We have maintenance time and we have actual time. Actual time is uh, whatever we do that leads us to achieve our vision, right? Pro which is, that which is proactive, uh, that which is considered productive, this is actual time. Maintenance time are those things that we, we do on the side. The amount of time you take to eat, the amount of time you, you, know, you take to get ready, the amount of time you take to make wudu, for example. Huh? You can do it in three minutes, you can do it in six minutes. You can have your cup of tea in three minutes, so you can do it in six minutes. If you need a cup of tea, that's actual time, three minutes. Maintenance time is a three minutes extra. Right? When you have a desire to seek knowledge, your balance of maintenance versus actual changes. And certain things that you were doing in maintenance, you, you let it go from your life. You don't need it. Why? Because you have more important things to do at that time. And that's what the scholars used to say. That the student of knowledge, he walks fast, he eats fast, and he writes fast. Now, eats fast doesn't mean you break the, the, the etiquettes of eating. No, that's, the, that's just what being said. You still chew your food, etc. But you don't spend a long time on the tawla. And you develop an ability to write fast. You walk fast. You're on a mission. You move from place to place. Right? Students of knowledge were known to have these characteristics. They reduce their maintenance time. Why? Because they have actual things to achieve. So that's the second um, uh, requirement when seeking knowledge. We said the first is what? Have a, have a vision. What's the second one? No. That's a symptom of it. We said the raghba, having a desire and a willingness to maintain it. Okay. <clears throat> the next one, my dear brother, an elder in Islam, is looking after your mind. Maintaining one's intelligence. Because seeking this knowledge needs diqqah. When you learn the knowledge of Islam, you need precision. And sadly, this is missing today, to an extent. Even at the level of postgraduate research. Diqqa and precision. You have to see yourself as more clinical than a surgeon in the surgery ward. You have to. Because you are signing on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or eventually you will be. Alright? Eventually you will be. We differentiate between the surgeon who passed with a C and the surgeon who passed with the A star. Differentiate between the two. We differentiate between the surgeon who's keeping their knowledge current, who's attending conferences, who's reading the medical, the latest medical journals, and the one whose knowledge is stuck in the 80s and the 90s. Right? We different, this, this is what we do in terms of matters of life. When it comes to matters of Allah and qal Allah and qal Rasul, it needs diqqa. It needs precision. And that needs us to develop our intelligence. Now this, this doesn't mean that we need to do IQ tests, etc. Because to seek the knowledge of Islam, you need one eye. Not the eye of IQ, the eye of ikhlas. Sincerity. Right? But everything has a process. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-ilmu bit-ta'allum. Knowledge is sought through seeking it. And if the faculty of knowledge is the mind, you need to keep that mind sharp. And that happens through different ways. And this is a documented science today. How to maintain the mind, your ability to remember. Mental exercises, you know, speed reading, how to develop your ability to read. Reading as opposed to watching. Understand what slows down the mind. The mind is a muscle. What grows it, what slows it down. If you're serious about seeking knowledge, that journey needs you to maintain your mind. And the sharpness of your mind. The dhaka of the mind. Imam Shafi mentions the dhaka. The sharpness of the mind. And that also boils down to your sleeping habits and your eating habits. Right? So this is something else that you need when you pursue your journey. What else do we need as a requirement? No doubt patience. And where do we learn this from? From the story of Musa and Khidr. Subhanallah. Because the theme of that story in Surah Al-Kahf is the theme of knowledge. Why did Musa travel to Khidr? 
because Musa initially, as we learn in the books of Tafsir from the reason of revelation shared, when he was praised after giving this amazing speech, he had this understanding that he's the most knowledgeable on earth. He didn't do it arrogantly. He did it because he was Kalimullah. He was the one who spoke to Allah. He was a prophet. He understood that I know more than everyone here because Allah teaches me. Allah informed him of Khidr who has knowledge that he didn't know. What did Musa eventually do? He set off to find Khidr. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَهُ لَا أَبْرَحُ حَتَّى أَبْلُغَ مَجْمَعَ الْبَحْرَيْنِ أَوْ أَبْضِي حُقُبَ Subhanallah. When Musa said to his servant, La abrahu, I will never rest. Until I reach the place where the two seas meet. Because Allah said, you will find my abd where the two seas meet. I will not rest until I reach that point, even if it takes me decades. Hukuba is in the plural. Decades. Subhanallah. You need patience. As the story progresses, and Musa finally, an ocean of knowledge, Musa, who does he meet? Khidr, who's also an ocean of knowledge. And it's amazing because they met where? Where the two oceans met. The two, se- <laughs> the two seas meet. It was really poetic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose that place for them. And Musa alayhi salam respectfully engages Khidr as a student, engages his teacher and says, I would like to um, uh, spend time with you and learn from you. What does Khidr say to Musa? إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيءَ مَعِيَ Sabara, you will not be able to be patient with me. And patient, patience is repeated how many times thereafter? Until the end. When Khidr says, That this is the explanation of that knowledge which I told you, you, you wouldn't be able to be patient with. Knowledge needs patience. Knowledge needs patience. And the scholars used to say, whoever takes knowledge wholesale, it will leave him wholesale. And that's how we said, you start a book with a teacher, and then you study that book again with that teacher, and again with that teacher from different angles, it needs patience. Today, subhanallah, the students of knowledge, I'm not going to generalize, we don't generalize, be fair, but meaning it's a norm, not the students of knowledge, but those who get into it. And this is also from the plot of shaitan. You attend one lecture, subhanallah, you're ready to give a fatwa. You attend a couple khutbas, you're ready to be a khatib. It doesn't work like that. Imam al-Bukhari, uh, he mentions an entire bab, an entire chapter in Sahih al-Bukhari. Bab al-ilmi qabla al-qawli wal-amal. The chapter of knowledge before speech and action. And the scholars of Islam in their books, Ibn Jama'i, Ibn al-Ghazali and others, they talk about bab al-ta'ahul qabla al-tasaddur. Subhanallah. The chapter of ta'ahul, becoming qualified before you announce yourself as a teacher and a reference for your community and society. So you need patience. وَالْعَجَلَةُ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ Hastiness is from shaytan. This is the opposite to shaytan. Shaytan will push you, will tell you, write that article, write that Facebook post, open your Instagram channel, start populating it with Islamic reminders. And so on and so forth. Before you are qualified. General reminders, no, no problem. No problem. If you know and you know that you know, no problem. But then also you need to be zaki, intelligent. Ask yourself, if I open an Instagram account and then I start putting reminders, what are people going to see me as? As a scholar. Then they're going to ask me questions. Am I willing to facilitate that? Am I willing to facilitate them? Or how much time is this process going to take away from me actually doing what I need to do to become qualified. Sometimes you put yourself out there before becoming qualified, it happens at the expense of it. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu is famous for saying this, that seek knowledge before you, become, before you assume positions of authority. Because once you do, you don't have time. In fact, some of our mashayikh, we felt this of them. When they were picked for certain positions of authority in the land, we felt that that was at the expense of them teaching. And we lost so much from them. Subhanallah. So, patience, as we learn from the story of, of Musa. And patience requires approach and process, my dear brother and elder, as to how you dress, you bath, you come fresh. It's all from the, from the idea of being patient, maintain a routine, you're disciplined. It requires this. You can't be, and especially in the online age, you know, all the cameras are off. 
We don't know how they're studying, whether they're wearing their vest, whether they're in their pajamas. Wallahu <laughs> alam. You don't know how the student is listening to the lecture. We don't even know how the teacher is teaching the lecture. Subhanallah. <laughs> right? And this goes against the idea of knowledge. Imam Malik used to make wudu before teaching hadith. Rahimahullah. Not because it was a requirement, but because of respecting the knowledge. Imam Shafi'i used to say, when I used to sit with Imam Malik, I used to turn the pages so softly out of fear of disrespecting the Shaykh. That needs patience, no? It needs patience to maintain yourself. Because all of us have different demeanors when you get on with things. But no, you recognize that this is the ideal. You train yourself. You need self-discipline. Self-discipline is from patience. It's included. Jibreel alayhi salam, when he came from the heavens as a teacher and a student of the Prophet, to teach the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the ummah, and he came as a student as well, how does he come to the Medina? How does he come to Masjid al-Nabawi? دَخَلَ عَلَيْنَا رَجُلْ شَدِيدُ بَيَاضِ الثِّيَابِ شَدِيدُ سَوَادِ الشَّعْرِ لَا يُرَى مِنْهُ أَثْرُ السَّفَرِ وَلَا يَعْرِفُ مِنَّا أَحَدِ حَتَّى جَلَسَ عِنْدَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَأَسْنَدَ رُكْبَتَيْهِ إِلَى رُكْبَتَيْهِ وَوَضَعَ كَفَّيْهِ عَلَى فَخِذَيْهِ وَقَالَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ سبحان الله Look at that introduction why is Umar ibn Khattab revealing all these details? He could have just said, this man came and asked the Prophet, tell me about Islam. No, he says, إِذْ دَخَلَ عَلَيْنَا رَجُلُ Suddenly someone entered upon us. شَدِيدُ بَيَاضِ الثِّيَابِ His clothing was the whitest of white. شَدِيدُ uh, uh, سَوَادِ الشَّعْرِ His beard was the blackest of black. Why, why are you describing this? Because there were no hotels in Medina. And we knew Medina. We know the people of Medina. If somebody comes into Medina, you'll see the signs of travel on them. You'll see the desert dust on their hair, on their beards, on their clothing. This person walked, walked into the masjid as if he just came from his home. But none of us know him. That's why Umar is revealing to us this. But where did the student come from? From the heavens. Light years of, of distance covered. And he enters in the most immaculate uh, forms. And then... He comes to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and sits as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is sitting. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sitting on his knees with his hands on his thighs. He sat in the same way. Today we sit in the dars. We all have to keep the walls of the masjid standing. Sah. Everybody looks for the wall. Put our back on the wall so we help the pillars for the period that we're in the masjid so that it doesn't feel the weight of the upstairs. <laughs> all right? And maybe our hair is not combed properly. All right? Maybe, you know, the clothes we're wearing, it has a smell on it. Maybe it's creased because we were wearing it two days ago. We're still wearing the same clothes. Then we come and we just enter and we want to seek this knowledge. When he was teaching us this hadith, Hafizahullah, he said, وَيُسْتَفَادْ مِنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ وَقَالَ الْعُلَمَاءِ مِنْ Min Fawaid had al hadith. He said that the scholars have taught us that from the benefits of the hadith of Jibreel is that the teacher gives the student based on how much the student gives the teacher. If the student comes fresh and ready and focused and ready, the teacher will give more. But if the student comes taban and tired and not ready and I had 101 things before this and this thing just came in the way of my day, then khalas, the teacher is a human being as well. He'll give you the bare minimum and he will leave as well. Okay, so this is all from uh, patience, uh, my dear brothers and elders in Islam. And subhanAllah, if you, if you read uh, Sirah Alam of Imam al-Dhahabi, subhanAllah, you know, it's amazing how he takes so much time to mention these points. In fact, I came across one story of uh, Ibn Tahir al-Maqdi, a 5th century scholar. Uh, he mentions Imam al-Dhahabi. He says that this uh, Imam, uh, Ibn Tahir, he says, Bultu dam fi talab al-hadith marratain. I spilled blood twice seeking hadith. Marratan fi Baghdad. Wa marratan fi Makkah. Once in Iraq, in Baghdad, and once in Mecca, Kuntu Amshi Hafian. I used to walk barefooted. Barefoot, barefoot. I didn't have shoes. But I had to seek the knowledge. I had to go to the teachers. I had to go to the narrators. So I walked it without any footwear in 
the hottest, under the hottest of suns and hottest of days. So he spilled blood seeking knowledge. Marratain. He says, "Wama rakibtu dab qat." I never ever uh, ascended upon an animal ever because he couldn't afford it. Fi talab al hadith in my seeking of hadith. He says, "Wa kuntu ahmilu kutubi ala zahri." I had to carry my books on my back, and the books back then were not like the books we have today. There were manuscripts uh, and manuscripts of different weights, different pages, different papers. Not the papers together. You want to keep it together. There's a lot that you have to do. He says, "Wama saaltu fi hal al-talabi ahdan abda." He goes, "I never ever asked when seeking knowledge anyone for any favor at any time." Kuntu aish ala ma yati. I used to eat based on that which Allah gave me. And this is this is patience, right? This is discipline. Today we complain about the teacher. Allah, the teacher, he made us go to sleep. We picky about the sheikh, and we want the sheikh to change. This is how we become. We want to dictate how the sheikh is, what car he drives, how he dresses, how he teaches, when he teaches, and so on and so forth. And this is why knowledge escapes us. And the scholars that the pious used to say about knowledge, uh, al-ilm, knowledge, if you give it all of you. It will give you some of it. Doesn't need you. Doesn't have an inferiority complex. It's not afraid. You need it. It doesn't need you. And as such, you need the scholars. They don't need you. And Subhanallah, Imam Ahmed, when he wrote his introduction in his Radd al Jahmiya, his introduction to his response to the Jahmiya when he was imprisoned during the time of uh, the son of Harun al Rashid, he began it eloquently by saying. الحمد لله الذي جعل في كل فترة من الرسل بقايا من أهل العلم. All praises belongs to Allah, who placed between every time span between prophets بقايا remnants of the people of knowledge. يدعون من ضل إلى الهدى. They invite those who went astray towards guidance. ويصبرون منهم على الأذى. And they are patient because of the harm that they give them. The student of knowledge should be patient. But the Sheikh has to be patient because of the harm that he gets from his students. وَيَصْبِرُونَ مِنْهُمْ عَلَى الْأَذَى يُحْيَوْنَ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى الْمَوْتَى وَيُبَصِّرُونَ بِنُورِ اللَّهِ أَهْلَ الْعَمَى Subhanallah. He says they give spiritual life بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ Using the book of Allah. يُحْيَوْنَ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى الْمَوْتَى Those who are spiritually dead. وَيُبَصِّرُونَ بِنُورِ اللَّهِ أَهْلَ الْعَمَى And they give spiritual sight to those who are spiritually blind. فَكَمْ مِنْ قَتِيلٍ لِإِبْلِيسٍ قَدْ أَحْيَوْ How many of those who were, uh, uh, who, who were massacred, who, were, who became spiritually dead because of the work of Iblis did they give spiritual life to? وَكَمْ مِنْ ضَالٍ قَدْ هَدَوْ And how many of those whose Iblis uh, caused to go astray were the scholars a means of them coming back to the right path? فَمَا أَحْسَنَ أَثَرَهُمْ عَلَى النَّاسِ How beautiful is the effect onto the people? وَمَا أَقْبَحَ أَثَرُ النَّاسِ عَلَيْهِمْ and how evil are the people's responses and attitudes towards them. So subhanallah, the student of knowledge needs to be patient, but the scholars have to be more patient. Huh? Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Ameen. Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. In fact, um, talking about this uh, knowledge, not having an inferiority complex, interestingly, I came across a paragraph related to Socrates, who is uh, the well-known Egyptian philosopher. When people went to him and said to him, they were amazed by his knowledge and they said, how, where did you get all of this knowledge from? How did you get all of this knowledge? He said, because I, sp he says, I've spent more on fuel than I have on water. What did he mean by this? The fuel needed to keep the lantern lit at night so he could read. He said, I've spent more on fuel than I have on water. Meaning all of knowledge requires patience. Even for those who are specializing in medicine and whatever you're specializing in, you need to be patient. Do not rush. Tayyib, uh, we spent a lot of time. Let me go through uh, the remainder quickly. Um, and perhaps this is the most important point in today's day and age. From the requirements of knowledge and the journey seeking knowledge, we spoke about finding a teacher, right? That teacher has to be knowledgeable, correct? That teacher has to be responsible as well. And this is something I cannot express enough. It's not about finding a knowledgeable teacher. It's about finding a knowledgeable and responsible teacher. This is fundamentally important, especially in this day and age. Okay? 
You see, my dear brother and elder in Islam, before the world was different. Not many people sought knowledge because not many people could read it or write. And access to books wasn't easy. So many people went into the service industry. They became carpenters, they became builders and so on and so forth. We live in a different age. We're in the enlightenment age, quote and quote, right? Education is a right before it wasn't considered a right. So that's one point. The next point is before the world existed under a caliphate, there was regulation. At the time of Harun al-Rashid, he regulated who could speak and who couldn't speak. The Mu'tazila could not speak. They could not give public lectures. They, they were confined to their private spaces. Whilst Imam Ahmed and others, uh, Qadi Abu Yusuf, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, and others, they had the Imam al-Shafi'i, they had the green light to speak. It was regulated. Not everyone who knew something could teach it. And not everyone who had something to say could say it. The world today is far different. Access to knowledge is available. The books of knowledge are being translated into languages, such as those without preliminary knowledge, they are reading the knowledge that were accessible previously to scholars. And then we have social media that's given everybody a platform. Before, the only voices you would hear are the voices of scholars who had access to radio channels and satellite channels or TV channels. It's different today. Today, everyone can open their YouTube channel, their Facebook channel, their Twitter channel, their social media channel, and they will develop an audience over time and they have a platform to say whatever they want to say. It's totally not regulated. As such, I add this caveat, this condition. You need to seek a responsible institute, not just one that's known to be knowledgeable. A responsible teacher, not just one who's known to hold a knot of knowledge. Okay? It's fundamentally important. We don't live in the time of the past. In the time of the past, for example, Imam Malik could say that I never passed the fatwa until 70 scholars of Medina gave me permission to do so. And when he was asked, what if one said no? He said, I wouldn't have passed the fatwa. And at the same time, when seeking knowledge as well, we don't have the luxury today because of the needs of the ummah, like Ibn Taymiyyah, for example. Imam al-Bazzar, in his Al-Alam al-Zakiyyah, he mentions that Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullahi alayhi, had 2,000 teachers. La ilaha illallah. <laughs> today we'd be lucky if we read 2,000 books. He had 2,000 teachers. So how many books did he read? Rahimahullah. The status of scholarship is not as it was. And the ailments of scholarship and knowledge and da'wah, sadly, is too many to mention. It was regulated before, it isn't regulated today. As such, to preserve your relationship with Allah, it's not enough for you to seek knowledge from the one who knows a lot. But rather the one who knows a lot and is responsible with that knowledge. How do, we, how do we understand this today? Well, it's important that you look out for those teachers who are not, or they don't have a reputation for being controversial. You look out for institutes that do not have a reputation for being controversial. Some people pride on this and they say, you know, me, this is who I am. I, I don't, I'm not scared of controversy. <laughs> who said this is praiseworthy? Who said this is a praiseworthy trait when dealing with the inheritance of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It's important you look out for teachers who know what to say, when to say, how to say it. What do they say on social media? And what do they say privately to their students in class? You get some, uh, those, some who are quote unquote knowledgeable, they don't know how to channel what they teach. What should be taught in class? They openly speak about it on social media and create controversy. Knowledge that is a, for, for a particular space, they place it in the wrong space. They might know, لِكُلِّ مَقَامٍ maqal. Every place has its speech that is right for it. You might hear that from them, but that's knowledge, but they're not responsible with that knowledge. They break the confinements of what they know. These are teachers you should avoid. These are institutes you should avoid. Avoid those teachers who lack responsibility when it comes to respecting the knowledge of the ulama of the first three generations of Islam after, up to the year 240 of the Hijrah. 
Those who find it very easy to belittle established knowledge in the first 240 years, uh, odd years of Islam, they're not responsible with their knowledge. Those who belittle that established then. Those who treat uh, the controversies of that time in a manner different to how it was understood by the uh, scholars who were considered references for the deen back then. These are people who are not responsible with their knowledge. So again, I repeat, it's not about having knowledge. Find yourself a teacher who's knowledgeable and responsible. If you see that your teacher has knowledge but has a reputation for controversy, stay away from this person. Alhamdulillah, there's many alternatives. There's many alternatives. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So this is fundamentally important. And remember, O seeker of knowledge and O student of the deen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with three fundamental entities that the knowledge of the sharia nurtures and develops. We have the intellectual power, we have the emotional power, and we have the physical power. We have the intellectual realm, we have the emotional realm, and we have the physical realm. And we see this in the Quran and the Sunnah, right? If you think knowledge is about developing your intellectual realm and forgetting about your emotional realm and your physical realm, you haven't understood what the knowledge of Qala Allah, Qala Rasul, Qala Sahaba is. I'll give you a practical example so you understand this. We talk about hikmah and wisdom and putting everything in its place. I remember my teachers when we started seeking knowledge, they used to always say that a faqih, a student of fiqh, a person who ends up becoming a faqih, and talks about halal and haram, la bud wa an yakuna lahu nafsun sawiyya. This person must have a balanced demeanor. You need to have a balanced demeanor. Subhanallah. I'll give you an example about how these entities are connected. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, la yaqdi al qadi wa huwa ghadban. The judge must not rule when he's, when he's angry. The judge must not rule when he's angry. When the judge rules, does he rule with his emotional side or his intellectual side? What do you guys think? When he looks at a case and he's understanding a case and he's concluding on a case, what's, what is he using? He's using his? Why is the Prophet ﷺ said he mustn't rule when he's angry? Anger is from the emotional realm, not so? But because the emotional realm is connected to the intellectual realm, a deficiency in one is going to create a deficiency in the other. So calm down, then rule. Yes, you might be the most intelligent person, but if you're angry at that time, don't rule. Because this is by design. Allah has created us like this. And through extension, the scholar said, لا يقضي وهو جوعان. He shouldn't rule when he's hungry. Hunger, hunger is physical, right? Anger is emotional. Hunger is physical, but he's ruling with his intellectual. Why shouldn't he rule when he's hungry? Uh, because the physical ailment or deficiency is going to have an effect on his intellectual efficacy or efficiency. Why? Because they're connected. When you seek knowledge, you are developing all these three realms, my dear brother and elder in Islam. It's not just about having knowledge here. That you know a lot of views, a lot of scholars, I've read every book, I know who said what and when he said it and how it's it, not enough. It's about knowing how to treat that knowledge, distill that knowledge. What does this knowledge mean in light of that knowledge? What does this knowledge mean in terms of the context of the century I'm living in, or the community I'm living in, or the masjid that I'm operating from? If you have an odd view, for example, for example, let's say the, pro the preponderant view is that Halloween isn't allowed, for example, and you adopt a view that it is, is it from you being responsible to go on social media and speak about it? Or speak about it in your masjid with your community? What's the responsible thing to do? When you know you're going against the majority, number one. And number two, by going on the social media, you will be speaking to the congregations of other imams and other scholars that do not need to hear that view. And by you doing that, there might be... Elements in that community who love to follow their desires, they will make you speaking on social media a means of them disrespecting their own imam. And we've seen this. 
Do you see now the lines of knowledge and responsible, respons- being responsible, how they converge? It's not about having book knowledge, my dear brother and elder in Islam. If you're seeking knowledge, seek it. And that's why our mashayikh, our teachers used to tell us to do mulazam. Mulazama meaning uh, when, when, when we trained as judges as well, you have to, or uh, one of the um, requirements is that you go to the court. And even those who qualify from the high institute of judiciary, then they go into the court and they spend a year with actual judges. You do this mulazam, all right? Why? Because you might have the knowledge, you might, ha- you might know the procedures, the, stand- the SOPs and so on and so forth. But subhanallah, when you are with a sheikh, what you learn from his character, what you learn from his ta'anni, his patience, his deliberation, what you learn from how he deals with different matters. This knowledge you won't find in the books. You won't find in the books. And that is why, and I've seen this, that those who graduated and they used to spend their time with mashayikh, they're different to those who graduated and just stuck to the university curriculum. They went, they studied, they passed, they went out and they did da'wah. They are different to those who went and they also benefited from their teachers. They had private gatherings with them. They persisted with their teachers until their teachers picked them. Subhanallah. One of the Western students has passed away now, rahimahullah. Uh, you might have um, read about him on some of my social media pages when he passed away uh, at the end of 2021. Uh, Brother Yusuf, Sheikh Yusuf from Australia. Subhanallah. I was fortunate to uh, meet him as soon as he arrived into Riyadh. And then subhanallah, it was the qadr of Allah that the day before I left the Riyadh for good, we buried him. Subhanallah. He used to sleep in the library of the mashaykh. He was next level. <laughs> he took it to the next level. I won't mention the mashaykh's names to preserve uh, the, the, the ikhlas and the rewards, but Yusuf would sleep there. Subhanallah, he would have such an interpersonal relationship with the sheikhs that he was a son from the sons of the sheikhs. That sometimes he would know something of the sheikh that even the sheikh's sons didn't know. Subhanallah. Right? And he would say things, or he could say things about the mashayikh in terms of the character and in terms of how they deal with things, which you never know about that sheikh from the classroom. And all this contributes to you being a student of knowledge, an effective student of knowledge, an established student of knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. We spend much time and um, uh, Maghrib comes uh, upon us. I want to end very quickly and then we'll open the floor to Q&A inshallah. Like I said, it's multifaceted. So we'll leave some uh, areas to the Q&A. Uh, I want to share with you what Imam al-Shafi'i uh, said when he spoke about the uh, the journey of seeking knowledge and what the student of knowledge uh, needs. And much of what I shared with you has an overlap with this. He says, Akhi, my brother, لن تنال العلم إلا بستة. You will never achieve knowledge except through six. And Imam al-Shafi'i, who is Imam al-Shafi'i? Subhanallah. I mean, the one who famously said, شَكَوْتُ إِلَىٰ وَكِيْعٍ سُوءَ أَحِفْضِ فَأَرْشَدَنِي إِلَىٰ تَرْكِ الْمَعَاصِ وَأَخْبَرَنِي بِأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ نُورٌ وَنُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُؤْتَهُ عَاصِي He says, I complain to my teacher Waqi' about my poor memory. <laughs> and Imam al-Shafi'i's memory was such, it is said that if he read a book, he had to block one page so he didn't memorize that page by mistake. <laughs> he would block it. And he's complaining to his teacher about his poor memory. So he says, my teacher advised me to stay away from sins. Um, he taught me that knowledge is a light from Allah's light and the light of Allah doesn't come to a sinner. This Imam al-Shafi was from the most prolific of scholars. He says, Akhi, my dear brother, So he says, my dear brother, you will never achieve knowledge except through six. And I will share with you uh, these, uh, the, um, uh, these six with clarity. The ka'in, we spoke about intelligence. Wa hirsin wa jtihadin wa bulghatin wa irshadi ustadin wa tuli zamani. Subhanallah. He says, you will not achieve knowledge except with six. Number one, sharpness of the mind, the ka. Number two, eagerness to learn. We spoke about it, right? You have what? Raghbah. You have this desire and a willingness to maintain it. And number three, sacrifice. Sacrifice. Wealth, 
time, relationships. Subhanallah. Ibn al-Qayyim says, that the, you, you know about a person benefiting from knowledge by looking at his friend circle before he sought knowledge and his friend circle after he sought knowledge. By looking at his activities before he sought knowledge and his activities after he sought knowledge. That they had a particular norm, but then they sought knowledge, what happened to their norm? He's not saying cut relations, but he's saying that you can't be the same person. You can't find ladda. You sought knowledge, it's going to make you find a sweetness in terms of relationships with other people than the people that you are with before. It's natural. Unless they come on board with what you are upon. So sacrifice your time, your wealth, some relationships, some of your activities, some things you consider mandatory, you make it elective. You say, khalas, I have flexibility with these matters. Why? Because my knowledge is coming in here. Right? Sometimes you want to be this amazing cricketer. But you love knowledge and cricket takes your time. You have to give up the cricket practice for the dars. You need to be patient. You need to sacrifice. To give up the cricket, you have to give up the cricket. And show Allah that you're sacrificing for His sake something which is better. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, whoever leaves something for Allah's sake, Allah will replace it with something better. Huh? The shabab are smiling at the back. I'm not saying leave your cricket practice. England needs some cricketers, right? They drew the ashes for the second time. You guys don't follow cricket. You do, huh? Tayyib. He says you need the means as well. Wabul ghatim. You need the means. But the means is relative. Right? As we said. Right? If you don't have it, you don't board the animal. You walk. You don't have it, you eat what comes to you. But you need some means. Right? You need books, you need teachers, you need travel, so you need a means. But it doesn't mean that you need means at a high level. Means is relative. You need a form of means. Then he says, and the company and guidance of a scholar. And this was the last thing we spoke about. And a scholar in the norms of the Salaf, my dear brother and sister in Islam, a alim, a alim. If you look at the writings of the Salaf, the pious, the earliest of generations, whenever they mention the term alim, they mean by it, مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ عِلْمًا وَعَمِلَ بِمَا تَعَلَّمَ Subhanallah. And may Allah forgive us all. An alim is the one who learns knowledge and implements it. That's an alim. Not the one who knows it and that's it. No, the one who knows it and implements it. We know the famous story of Imam Ahmed. When a student came into his home to live with him. And Imam Ahmed let him stay in his library and left him with water. And in the morning, Imam Ahmed came through at Fajr and saw the water hadn't been touched. And Imam Ahmed said, how can a student of Hadith learn Hadith without having a wird, without taking it upon himself to have a meeting with Allah and some portion of the night? So, they understood knowledge at a different level. Right? It wasn't knowledge junkies. It was like knowledge junkies or knowledge junkies. We always want to know the next, what's the next new thing? We, 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 it's like we're addicted to it. Right? You say, brother, how was that talk? Yeah, it was okay. Uh, why? I, I heard it before. Tayyip Allah said, You heard it before. How much of that knowledge are you implementing? <laughs> Allah says, remind in reminders there's benefits for the believers. So you heard that khutbah. But you downplaying it because you heard it before. But how much of it are you practicing? That's the question. Now they weren't knowledge junkies then. They were patient in how they sought knowledge. They weren't just jumping from book to book and knowledge to knowledge and lecture to lectures. How you flick the screen on TikTok and Instagram. Yeah? <laughs> no. In fact the Sahaba would say that we would learn 10 verses of the Quran. Memorize it understand it, implement it, and then learn another 10. When, it was, when, we, when we walked the talk, then we took another 10. It is said that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, in another narration, his son, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, took them 10 years to complete Surah Al-Baqarah. 10 years. Meaning to, to be grounded with Surah Al-Baqarah. Subhanallah. So, you need patience, you need the company and guidance of a scholar. 
company and guidance of a scholar. Ibn Hazm, Imam al-Shatibi, rahimahullah, in his uh, muwafaqat, he uh, sort of takes a swipe at uh, Imam Ibn Hazm. He says he had many mistakes. And why did he have many mistakes? Because he just used to read books. He wasn't known to sit at the feet of the scholars. Right? And that's why he went from one madhab to another. Eventually he denied Qiyas and he became a proponent for the Zahiri madhab. We might not agree with Imam Ashatibi, but Imam Ashatibi was very methodical in his approach and he mentions this. So, the company and guidance of a scholar. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us students of knowledge who are able to walk in the footsteps of the scholars. That we, we, It's difficult to find scholars, but students of knowledge who inshallah can at least plug some of the gap, right? So at least we don't become too um, void of the oxygen that we need, I mean. And then, as we said, number six, he says, وَطُولْ زَمَانِي You need to be willing to spend a long time seeking it. التَّأَهُلْ قَبْلَ التَّصَدُّرْ Qualifying before announcing yourself. Qualifying before branding. Huh? <laughs> before putting yourself out there. Once I came across a, a sister online, she was answering questions. Answering questions. So I wrote to her, I said, sister, where did you study? I said, answers were okay. Answers were okay. I said, where did you study? She said, no, I haven't studied. I'm studying. I said, okay, where are you studying? At one of the online uh, seminaries. I said, okay, in Arabic or English? English. Fatwa 101, Rasm al-Mufti 101, is no one should pass a fatwa except if they understand the evidence from the Arabic itself. Not a translation of somebody of that Arabic. You don't open a translation of the Quran and then read a, a translated verse or a translated hadith and then pass a fatwa, deduce from it, no. So I said to her, I said, Ukhti, uh, you, you're not uh, qualified to do this. You should stop. Well, what, what, but what's wrong with my answers? And I said, but I said, Ukhti, do you know that part of the fatwa is understanding the context of the mustafti. You have to understand the context of the person seeking the fatwa. You don't copy paste the same fatwa for every individual. And this is from the ailments of our time. Now I'm, I, I don't want to, I, I meaning I'm not trying to put the sister down or those who do it. There's people who have uh, sincere intentions uh, through what they do and they say, Sheikh, we live at a place, there's not many scholars, there's no one who answers the questions. If we don't answer, like one person told me, Sheikh, if I don't answer, they will go to the people of Bid'ah and they will get the answer. So I'm not, again, not being stereo-minded or stereotyped. But in normal circumstances, خُذُوا حِذْرَكُمْ Right? يعني حَبَّ حَبَّ As the Ahli Hijaz say. The Hijazi dialect. حَبَّ حَبَّ Take it step by step, يا أخي. شوي شوي. Slowly, slowly. شوي يا حاج. Take it easy. Slowly, slowly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. I mean, I think the camera has told us it's time up. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين.